I'm Carol Becker, Dean of Columbia University School of the Arts, and I want to begin with our land acknowledgement. The School of the Arts recognizes Manhattan as part of the ancestral and traditional homeland of the Lene, Lenape, and Wappinger people, and by acknowledging legacies of displacement, migration, and settlement, we are attempting a very first step toward the long and overdue process of healing and repair. I'm thrilled to introduce this event to you today and to say a few words about the art of listening underwater, a unique sound spatial installation by artist Yanda Winderand that we are so fortunate now to have up at the Lantern, which is the top floor of the Lenfest Center for the Arts, designed by the fabulous Renzo Piano Building Workshop. And the Lenfest Center is located at 615 West 129th Street on the Columbia University Manhattanville campus. This is the new campus of Columbia. And at this location, and with the artist's advisement, we have carefully placed 25 ottomans in the space so that members of the audience can each take a seat or recline and immerse themselves in this contem contemplative installation between February 13th, a third and 13th from two to eight every day. So those of you listening, I hope you'll come up. Given all that has happened in the last two years, the multitude of events that were postponed or canceled because of COVID, I'm particularly grateful that we have been able to open Yana Winderin's piece to the Columbia University community, but also to the general public. Gavin Browning, our Director of Public Programs and Engagement, and I first experienced an iteration of this installation, sponsored by the Swiss company Audemars Piguet at Art Basel, Miami Beach, in 2019. And I knew then that we would bring this piece to Columbia. But what I did not know at that pre-COVID time was how much we would need and want such a contemplative, thoughtful, and regenerative experience at this particular time. How well it would fit within our programming series on the theme of repair, because of course we hadn't even thought that we would need repair at that time, and how important it would be to remind us of the anthropogenic underwater sounds, which are so intrusive and destructive to the millions of species that inhabit our underwater environments. This piece is a very expert, gorgeous, an intriguing mix of sounds from multiple locations around the world, including those recorded by the artist just last week. During the early days of the pandemic, when the noise pollution from planes and boats and cars was drastically reduced, while those who could attempted to shelter in place, many humans, for the first time, began to pay more attention to how the noise we create can affect other species. We also began to be aware of projects such as the Quiet Sound Program in Seattle that attempts to reduce the impact of shipping on the diminishing population of orcas in Puget Sound and in Canada. Because we as a species were in slowdown mode with neither boats nor planes in action to the same degree, the environment for all species was calmer and healthier. And thus our fellow creatures were able to communicate more clearly with each other Many of us reveled in this re realization, and for a moment, we became more engaged in supporting actions that reduce such noise, which is often inaudible to human ears and invisible to our eyes. The experience of Jana Winderin's piece, which is about all of these things, is also about wonder, and it is exemplary of what art can do, how it can engage our senses, make us more aware of the world we are in, of the complexity, of human relationships to the planet and of our own relationship to ourselves. We are so grateful to have Yana with us. We are equally delighted that spatial audio specialist Tony Mayat arrived to work with Yana to tailor this piece to the location. And we are also very pleased to have the curator for Audemars Piguet, Denis Pernay, with us. Let me introduce each of them to you. At the very last minute, Mihan Christ could not be with us today. So I will be the interlocutor in her place and try to anticipate some things she might have asked. Jana Windrin is a sound artist and recordist who currently lives and works in Norway and has consistently engaged environmental concerns in her work. She has a background, very interestingly, in mathematics and chemistry and fish ecology from the University of Oslo. And she studied fine art 
at Goldsmiths University in London. She has exhibited and performed her work internationally in Helsinki, Miami, Oslo, Wuzen, Amsterdam, and in New York for the Park Avenue Tunnel, the Department of Transportation, and at MoMA. Her practice pays particular attention to audio environments, which are hard for humans to access, both physically and orally. Deep underwater space, inside ice, or in, frequently, in frequency ranges inaudible to the human ear. This piece alone involves recordings from multiple locations, the Barents Sea around the North Pole, Iceland, Greenland, Thailand, the Caribbean, and off the coast of Miami, alongside new recordings she made last week in and around New York in the Atlantic and in the Hudson near the Lenfest Center and in the East River just days before the opening. And to welcome Yana and Gavin on their recording expedition off the coast of New Jersey was a humpback whale. Pretty cool. Tony Mayad has worked closely with Yana Windrin for the past decade. He is a remarkable sound artist, recordist, practitioner, and professor of sound at the University of Surrey in the UK. He specializes in spatial audio production, the creation of three-dimensional sound projections for sound installation, art, film, and live audio performances. And much of his work is designed to create immersive spatial audio reproductions of wildlife and natural phenomena to create awareness of threatened habitats, the impacts of climate change, and species threatened by human action. He is also the founding editor of Organized Sound, an international journal of music and technology, which is published by Cambridge University Press. I would now also like to introduce Denis Pernet. He is a Swiss curator, critic, and researcher who has been an art curator at Audemars Piguet since November 2018. Together with Audrey Teichmann, he is responsible for Audemars Piguet Contemporary, the ambitious art program of the manufacturer, which commissions international artists to create contemporary artworks and fosters a global community of creators. As such, Pernet defines and manages the manufacturer's art commissions by established and emerging artists presented at important venues. And over the last 20 years, Pernet has organized at least 40 symposia and performances in Switzerland. Audemars Piguet has been a fantastic and extremely generous partner with us in bringing Jana Winderen and this project to Columbia University, and we are very grateful for their partnership. Before I begin, I need also, before we begin, I also must thank Gavin Browning for his amazing work in helping to make this event possible and a great public success. I would like to thank the Lenfest Center staff for their focus, their expertise, and their enthusiasm, as well as our many co-presenters, Teachers College, Arts Administration, the Arts Initiative, Barnard and Columbia College's Architecture Department, the Department of Biological Sciences, the Center for Science and Society, Columbia Narrative Medicine, Columbia Religious Life, Columbia Water Center, the Computer Music Center, Lamont Dougherty Earth Observatory, the MFA Sound Art Program, the MFA Visual Art Program, and of course, the School of the Arts. And the reason that I list all of those is for you to see that it's the arts that bring everything together at Columbia. Please feel free to leave your questions in the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen, and we're going to have a chance to pose these questions to the participants at the end. So let me now hand this over to Denise Pernet. Thank you very much, uh, Carole. Um, as mentioned, I'm um, Denis Pernet, curator at uh, Audemars Piguet Contemporary. Audemars Piguet is a mechanical switch, uh, watch company based in Switzerland, established in 1875. And Audemars Piguet Contemporary is the art program that supports contemporary artists by commissioning them a new artwork. We give them a carte blanche, total freedom to imagine any project they want to develop. It can be maybe the opportunity to do something they didn't have a context to do before, maybe experiment on different scales, or just um, accompany their ongoing research. Um, the artworks belongs to the artist, so it's also part of the support, and we don't have a collection. We are two um, curators uh, specialized in contemporary art in the program, 
and we accompany the artist uh, to develop the artwork from inception to exhibition. We are also very happy when the project can travel, and this is the case here with Jana Winderen, The Art of Listening Underwater, that's presented now at the Landfest Center for the Arts at Columbia University. Um, we commissioned two artworks with Jana Winderen, a first sound piece in summer 2019. She came to visit us. Uh, the factory is in the Swiss mountain, there's a lake, and she recorded sounds in the environment in the lake. And, the, and that piece was first presented in Basel, Switzerland in summer 2019. The second artwork was The Art of Listening Underwater, a very ambitious, complex sound installation that was first presented, as Carol already mentioned, uh, in Miami Beach in December 2019. So for us it is an immense pleasure and also a great honor that the artwork um, the Art of Listening Underwater is now presented again at the Landfest Center for the Arts at Columbia University. So I take this moment, the opportunity to thank very dearly Carol Becker, Lauren Weigel, Gavin Browning for the invitation and their fantastic warm welcome. And I also thank the artist Jana Winderen, her collaborator Tony Mayet for the fantastic work they've done here, and as you heard, um, Jana also recorded sounds here in New York to, uh, to have this, this piece very site-specific. Uh, and uh, you will soon hear more about this sound installation directly from the artist and from uh, Tony Mayet. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Zeni. And uh, also, oh, look, take this off. Whew, feeling naked now. <laughs> thank you, uh, Denny, for the introduction, and thank you also for this uh, long uh, collaboration we have. I really appreciate that very much, and also Carol and uh, Gavin and all the, the crew here uh, with. Um, yeah, Brendan and Gabe and everyone. Uh, and it's been a total pleasure to work here in this fantastic space. So first of all, I want to say that very much thanks for that. I will uh, tell you a little bit about my background, as uh, you know, Carol introduced me very well. So I won't spend too much time on that, but um, uh, we'll directly start with this image here. And this is in Jana where I visited Rudreng uh, Ramanyai, or I was there with, uh, with um, uh, to, I was there to um, uh, record uh, out in the fjord out by them. And um, as several of the recordings you hear in the installation is from that location. There is an enormous biodiversity there and you can hear it. Um, let me just... And uh, going back to um, my studio in uh, Norway now, uh, it is um, overlooking the lake Mjösa, and uh, I have always been, um, you know, concerned with how we are as human beings together with the other species we share the planet with. And uh, the Mjösa here was about to die from algae overgrowth when I was a child, and it was enormously scary. Uh, for me, of course, there was the drinking water, I mean, the fish were dying. And uh, so it always been a concern for me. And I spent most of my childhood also on and underwater a lot on the south coast of Norway. And I've always been curious about these sort of unexplored areas uh, of the planet, which it still is. And um, as uh, you know, we have all been now in this uh, COVID situation and spending more time at one place. You get to kind of know a bit more the creatures we are sharing the planet with and you see them over time. And uh, this one here, I mean, I started to see, you know, you start to notice details and you start to listen and hear, I hear him before he's uh, coming now, you know, and also around the 
where he lives, you know, I can hear the mice under the snow, uh, you know, start to listen and hear things before you actually see it. And then you start to see the movement of the bodies and how they interact with each other. And, uh, you know, you start to pick up more and more things by concentrated listening. And every time I'm out recording, I always bring my camera. And I met this one uh, <laughs> out in a, a smaller lake. And, uh, and then I got home and I looked better at the photographs. So I have a macro lens with me. And I saw this little creature here, you know. If you see, he's like, he's just sitting there by the nose on, the <laughs> on him, you know. You see? <laughs> and uh, uh, here also this one, which is sort of fishing for vibrations. You see how it's holding the string into its net. And if I, I was just pushing that net and uh, he wasn't moving at all, but then the fly came in and he was immediately there. So he senses the vibration, you know. Um, you can see it there on the, on the photograph. And uh, this one here has a bulldog, but he is uh, fishing with echolocation towards the surface. He uses sound down towards the surface of the water and then he grabs the fish. And uh, I was, when I recorded him, I was working on a piece for Museum Modern Art here in New York and uh, with the echolocation just above the surface of the water and the echolocation from underneath. Um, there was also, um, we were, up, so it was brilliant because he was sort of crossing the surface. He was grabbing the fish with his echolocation. It was uh, um, recorded by, in uh, Panama. It was um, recording actually from a boat. And uh, I wanted to play to you this an example of what it sounded like, you know, ultrasound we can't hear. It's like above our audible range of what we can hear. It's what we call ultrasound. My ultrasound is much lower than 20,000 hertz. That is kind of sad limit, but mine is much lower because I'm getting older and I don't hear the high frequencies anymore. Uh, but this is what it sounds like. So um, the really, really high frequencies to hear, you hear this 10 times down and then the lower frequencies are 20 times slowed down. And here you see two species of um, old bats um, echolocating. You can actually tell the species according to the uh, frequency they are echolocating on. And we are also making sound in this range, but we have no idea. <laughs> you know? So you see around between 40 and uh, 50 hertz there. There is quite a lot of things going on. Um, and your cat and your dog will hear this and rats hear it. You know, they are calling each other around you know, 30,000 hertz. They have what I call like a love song. It's another project I worked on uh, that um, I was trying to find the love song of rats. And when I was working with art, I also realized that we put a lot of sound in this area, but we're not aware of it. Like we also are doing underwater. This uh, fish, uh, this carp, he is um, uh, called a hearing specialist by us humans. Um, he can hear in the same range as us. You can also see in infrared uh, light, and it makes sense, you know, because he's uh, in kind of maybe more murky water, and then it's uh, you know would easily get dark uh, when you got to get a bit further down. So it's very useful to use sound. Um, my tools, uh, after many years, you know, it's uh, specialized a lot the last sort of 15 years now towards uh, recording underwater. I started working with sound in 1992 when I was still a student at Goldsmith. But I've specialized now to uh, underwater, uh, so I see them as my kind of instruments. And um, uh, I had this kind of idea at some project I was working on that um, it was in the river and I suddenly heard this sort of underwater insect sounds. It was actually far into um, 
uh, forest in Russia, not this image here, but the first time I heard an underwater insect, and they have the, the use stridulation, they rub body parts together, make a really loud sound. Um, and uh, I also spoke with them some um, freshwater biologists, and they are counting underwater insects and looking at which are there and which are not there to say something about the health of a body of water. So I thought, what if I, you know, um, identify the sound of each of these insects? Can I then say that I can listen to the health of an underwater body? Uh, no, <laughs> I can listen to the, a body of water. Uh, to its health. So the biologist said, yeah, well, you know, it, you probably, it, you can't do it, you can suggest this, but um, what is feeding on this microphone? Then, but no. Um, so I'll play you a sound from the environment you just saw. Quiet. Sorry, I'll jump further. Uh, I also do drawings uh, as an observation, form of observation. Uh, when I'm out there, I take photographs or I observe uh, the creatures and I need to concentrate to know very well to kind of, ooh, is that leg, where, how is it going? How is it stuck to the body? You know, what is the cilia hairs doing? So it's also a way of sort of concentrated uh, observation. The idea of listening uh, to the health of a, uh, of the underwater environments, I also uh, suggested for TBA21, um, then called uh, Living Archive, uh, Tyson Bornamita are contemporary uh, back in 2009 or 10. And um, uh, here we are at uh, the Silver Bank. Uh, I was also there with uh, Tony Mayat. And uh, we were, I was there to listen to the coral reef. Uh, to, I suggested that we could listen and hear how it was doing, you know, what if it was um, a good environment. And we met uh, there loads of humpbacks. And, um, you know, he looks quite uh, much bigger than a little underwater insect, uh, obviously, but he's a calf. Because they go there to give birth and uh, they also um, meet there to mate uh, later in that season. And they sing uh, a lot. There you go. They make uh, a new song every year that they uh, learn is 40 minute development from the sort of really low bassy stuff to the really high frequencies. Um, I work with a minimum two hydrophones at different depths. The sound uh, is different from different depths in the water. Uh, So this was a toadfish and uh, uh, echolocating dolphin. Um, a project I was involved with for several years also, from which you were also here recording in the installation, is this, um, which became spring bloom in the marginal ice zone. It's uh, from the area in the Barents Sea, uh, which is, um, has sea ice at a certain time of year. And um, this particular image here is from towards the North uh, Pole. It's not far from the actual geographical North Pole point. And uh, you know, you see it looks quite uh, nice. You would imagine the sound is really good there. You know, this from the ice and the movement of the ice, you know, this kind of breeze that was there. But it was just enormous amount of motor sound of, of, a, uh, of a generator of energy of uh, power energy generators. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I show this image to show that, you know, the image can say one story, but if you had also the sound, 
the story would be a completely different one. And even at the North Pole point, um, when I was there, uh, it was a lot of cheering um, people that had reached the North Pole point and uh, drinking champagne. You know. So it was, uh, we can, you know, it doesn't look like that there, does it? <laughs> we have colonized the whole planet with our sound. And even where you heard um, toadfish, um, and I was also, that recording was from Belize. Uh, every 10 minutes, there was a little plane overhead and it came into the water. You know. uh, here, you come in with this massive, big uh, research ship, you know, lots of sound. And I need to go quite far away with a small boat away from the research ship to be able to hear all, you know, the smaller sound and the smaller creatures. I mean, this was a sound that you would hear, uh, will hear in the installation, uh, which is a bearded seal that I met there. And of course, when there is no sea ice, there is also difficult for this uh, seal to give birth and to have his pups on. Um, and also uh, the plankton. What will happen with the spring bloom? You know, this is one of the most important carbon sinks we have on the planet. Uh, there is a large production um, here also of oxygen for uh, the creatures that are living in the water that needs to have oxygen uh, present. The zooplankton eats the phytoplankton and they poo and they die and it all falls down to the benthic layers and get eaten and then gets stored there It's carbon. Um, at this research trip, I met Carlos Duarte, and he invited me to be co-authoring um, the paper about this, um, the soundscape of, of the Anthropocene Ocean, which, of course, um, is enormously problematic. Um, I will not go too much into this here, but uh, this is a problem that we can solve. You know, it's when we turn off the sound, when we do regulations, when we kind of take care this is gone. You know, when the sound is off, it's gone. Um, and uh, th these are, um, yeah, okay. <laughs> and bringing me now back to the, okay, the scene. You will recognize this sound also from the installation and it is from a school of fish in an area which I mentioned right in the beginning in China, which has a massive biodiversity of fish. Um, here is from the recording in Miami that Denis was mentioning. Uh, I was making uh, recordings locally there when we uh, installed uh, the piece there. I'm sorry, the sound is very quiet, but I, I can't access the... Oh, there we go. <laughs> um, this was from Miami, and then this is here at Belmar, um, when we were out a few days ago uh, and met a humpback, like Carol was mentioning, and uh, <laughs> photographed by, by Gavin there. Uh, and there he is. And he might be one of the ones that was at the Silver Bank that uh, Tony and I met uh, like you know, seven years back. And also the one I saw in the North of Norway because I just came from there before I came here uh, from the North of Norway because they are migrating from the North uh, up in Norway and uh, down to the Caribbean. And uh, this is an important lane for them in, for, of migration. And uh, we put, you know, there's this all opening of the Northeast Passage now that, uh, you know, with the shipping happening, and I'm very, uh, you know, worried about this uh, shipping lane that will go down there, you know, and the opening of uh, new areas for, for oil exploration, exp, uh, exploration, which they keep doing in Norway. You know and uh, also on the north coast of, of Russia there. Uh, yeah, this was just also from down here. 
the site where you can actually see outside of the window uh, in the exhibition room. Uh, and so what do I do with the sound? Logging, very important. I go back and log all the sounds, make notes, make little comments, you know, done that for years. I have loads of these little sketchbooks. Then starting to work with it according to what kind of outcome it will have. Will it be a release? Will it be a radio program, sound for film, you know, for an installation? Then I would uh, work with it in my studio. It's a total mess. <laughs> Um, and I set up the speakers in a constellation that is kind of similar to one I have in uh, in the in the installations or in the situation that they will be um, that the piece will be presented in. And uh, I start also then uh, discussions with uh, Tony and uh, we start working towards. Uh, the pieces here you see Tony sitting in the middle of the space we had at the Museum of Modern Art back in, yeah, when was it? 13. Uh, and yeah, and then also here, again working with the um, world stage that we are also working with here uh, in the Park Avenue tunnel. It was a 64 channel uh, installation where you walked through eight different environments uh, of underwater environments. Um, and uh, like I mentioned, uh, up in the uh, sea ice area, uh, this was the piece I, I did for uh, outside of um, Mutsikebau for uh, Sonic Act Festival, was commissioned by them. And uh, I kept put this image because I worked there like for four days to work the sound into the environment. Because one sometimes, you know, it would, it would be raining. It would be like the ship going past uh, the, in the canals there. And um, uh, so you have to kind of, uh, I try to work with the location and not against it. Uh, and completely a different uh, version, which is this um, release that I work with Touch, uh, the label, which is now 40 years old label. Here's a completely different environment where I had to be very gentle with uh, what come out. It's what there for the whole summer. I used transducers inside of these boats run by uh, solar panels for the whole summer, actually. But you know, to be really delicate because the, the, the sound environment there was very delicate, completely opposite of this. It was more like a, you know, um, work site, or you call it, it's like a building site uh, underneath this uh, car bridge where. Uh, this rat uh, installation of the love song on rats was installed on a 10 speaker setup. But they, I could really go, like, I mean, you could make it really quite loud and present. And it could work. There was nobody living there, you know, except, of course, uh, there could be that the rats lived there. Um, more uh, similar uh, situation like this one here, which was um, Rising Tide at the you know, um, Kunsthandelshus in, in Oslo some years ago, uh, couple of, 19 actually, yeah. And coming to Miami Beach, uh, the collaboration or the commission from Audemars Piguet, which was the second one that I did with them, um, where the, is the same piece as here, but also a very different piece because it's such a different environment. You know, you came from the beach, you came from the warmth uh, outside into a dark sort of cave-like space and a, a completely different situation. So it becomes a new piece, but the content will be the same, but I will call it a new piece. Uh, you know, but we are... Um, so, uh, and then via this piece again, uh, which was uh, in uh, Helsinki on a rowing stadium, where it was a lot of uh, sound, of course, from the water, from the, the overlooking there, and uh, the trees, you know, that, and the birds that flew past. It all becomes part of the installation when it's outdoors like this. And then uh, here, working, yeah, just like upstairs, uh, when I had to kind of totally rework the piece. 
you know, have to really totally start. It, you don't really start at scratch, but it's almost, you know, you have to really sense the space, start working with the different um, acoustics and how it physically feels, that space. So if, yeah, there you can listen more to my stuff and uh, check out the website and then I will leave with that to the Tony. <laughs> Thank you, Jana. Just give me one moment. Um, thanks, Jana, and uh, thanks very much to Carol, of course, for her generous introduction and invitation, and also to Gavin and the team at the Lenfest Centre for allowing us to uh, um, install this work, which has been a great uh, privilege and pleasure to do. Um, and, uh, you know, as Jana says, a, a, a reincarnation of a work that was made really for a different space and actually brings, uh, uh, sheds a lot of light on what one has to consider when you move something from uh, one, one very different venue to another. Um, as Carol said, I, I'm a professor of sound at the University of Surrey and the head of the School of Music and Media uh, there. And my research and practice focus on spatial audio. Um, and primarily it's production and the presentation in installations and live performances. Um, uh, I'll talk mostly about uh, spatial production today and I'll say a little bit about how this work comes to be technically and, 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 uh, and, and, and also in relation to my input to, uh, to a project of, uh, of this sort. Um, but I should also say I do have a profound interest in the conservation of species and, uh, and the environment. Uh, and I'm quite fortunate that these themes are very closely linked to some of the projects that I've worked on, um, which you know use sounds from the natural world and bring quite engaging sound phenomena and sound materials to uh, to large audiences. I just maybe move on to this other sound. Um, I've collaborated for, for more than 10 years with Jana on, on major installations, but I also work with quite a number of other artists uh, in different uh, in, um, circumstances. Uh, I'm, I'm, a lot of this work um, is generated for art gallery configurations, uh, such as this one in one of the tanks in the Tate Modern, which was related to an installation and a film with the artist Carlos Casas and Chris Watson um, that we did a, uh, a few years ago. Um, but I say, you know, I'm, I'm quite pleased that a lot of my work doesn't live in, entirely in an art gallery context. And you know, my uh, place of work can vary enormously from, from a university to uh, an art gallery to this rather muddy field which can, and, and container which contains all my computers and the technology I need to generate the sound uh, directed to the loudspeakers. This was actually um, the controls panel for a, an installation, uh, again with Chris Watson, which, which put speakers very high in the treetops, uh, a piece that was presented at dusk as the, uh, uh, as the sun went down. Um, and there are a number of projects which I've done which, which uh, are in the sort of public domain. This is a rather crazy one at a, a place called Berry Head on the south coast of England where a sound system was suspended on a, on a, on a rock face for visitors who were walking on country paths uh, by the sea to encounter. Um, I think presenting work in public, this is a work called Morning Line, which I'll say a little bit more about um, later, is a very important part uh, of my interest in, in, in spatial sound to so actually take um, this type of installation outside of the high art gallery or the, the, the classical concert hall and into places where anybody can um, uh, experience it and engage with it uh, in some way. My work can actually begin at a very early stage. As Jana said, in, in, in studio environments, uh, I would often um, talk to Jana, maybe supply with software to produce certain types of audio that would go into an installation for uh, different types of configuration. Often I might uh, accompany artists on uh, field trips to capture uh, spatial audio, and then also work with people on the, on the development of, of the final installation within the space, which as Jana said, is a very important part of the, uh, the work we do, but it's also, um, quite critical in, in my, uh, as, as I'll, I'll explain in a moment, um, from my perspective, in terms of making truly spatial sound that you can engage with and you can experience and is somehow believable to you as a, uh, as a, as a listener. 
I was quite fortunate to spend a large portion of my career working at the University of York in the UK with a guy who uh, had been in touch and connected with um, Michael Gerson, who was the founder of uh, or the inventor of, of, of ambisonics, um, uh, uh, a guy called Dave Mallam, who uh, did an awful lot of innovation and, and work uh, around ambisonics. Um, but we spent a period in the sort of late 80s, uh, 90s, uh, experimenting and developing both computer systems, computer audio systems that might reproduce ambisonics, and also loudspeaker configurations, um, which um, we did all sorts of crazy things too that we're not so you know supposed to do, like set them up in large venues and listen from a, a different place altogether. But it gave us a really interesting perspective on what uh, different types of sound technology could do uh, at that period. And Dave and I published a paper for the Computer Music Journal in, in uh, 1995, which was really a call to the computer music community not to forget ambisonics um, as a way of representing spatial sound. And I'll say a little bit more about that technology um, shortly. Um, during this time, it became very clear to me that actually the, 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 the um, ability to really hear spatially uh, from a reproduced sound system wasn't actually just a technical problem. A lot of people at the time would say, well, actually it's just to do with how many loudspeakers you've got or what technology you're doing, but it's not really just that. And uh, again, I was quite fortunate to, um, to find like minds in uh, a guy called Peter Lennox and, and John Vaughan, who um, worked with me at the, at the university to explore some spatial audio perceptual uh, theories. And uh, we published a series of paper, papers over about 10 years relating to our findings in that area and the type of uh, things that we thought were important. We looked at perception research as it was published uh, per se, and this was largely theoretical work, although there were quite a lot of experiments there. Um, and a lot of that work was in the visual domain. Um, audio domain and, and, its, and, and spatial perception weren't very uh, advanced fields uh, at the time. Um, and uh, we produced a sort of a whole series of, of sort of pointers to the perceptual concerns that might be important to help us understand and hear spatial audio that might be, go beyond what we, uh, what we imagined was a technological solution. Um, in, in 2008, I was approached by uh, Tissen Bornemitzer Art Contemporary, TBA21, who Jana uh, spoke of earlier, um, with, with a, uh, to, to look at a project called The Morning Line. This is a, a three-dimensional sculpture by the New York artist Matthew Ritchie uh, and the architecture firm Aranda Lash, um, who made this work with a concept that it would have something to do with sound. Um, in fact, um, I put together a team to work on this over a period of time, um, and uh, it, it, it became one of the first places to, for us to experiment and really try out some of the um, ideas that we developed in this sort of perceptual-based uh, research. Um, this sculpture was designed to have all these various coloured zones of sound, so what we did was create very uh, quite coherent local environments, but the ability, because of the nature of the sculpture, to listen through that to lots of other environments and understand a much bigger sound projection across the whole piece. This, as you saw, was exhibited in uh, Seville, which was the last slide that, that, that I showed you, and then also in Istanbul earlier, and then finally in Vienna, before it went to the ZKM in, in uh, uh, Karlsruhe in Germany, which, uh, and lost its structure and just became speakers on wires and an indoor uh, installation of multiple sound zones. Actually, the piece is now permanently installed outside the ZKM there, so it's possible for people to visit and experience this work uh, as a permanent exhibit there. Um, that actually um, led me to um, meet and discuss some issues with Peter Weibel, who put together this fantastic uh, MIT publication um, related to sound art. Um, and I was uh, fortunate to be invited to do a chapter related to sound pavilions, which, uh, to cut a long story short, is something that uh, articulates the real need for this type of experimental architectural structure and, and spaces which are flexible enough to experiment and explore with spatial audio. Spatial audio itself is a done deal, right? We all know about it. We've seen, we've got it on our phones now. Spatial audio button exists on your phones. You can press it and suddenly the world is spatial, except it doesn't seem to quite work like that for me. Um, and, you know, despite Dolby Atmos, despite Apple Spatial Audio, despite home cinema, VR, AR, and 
Google and YouTube having tools that do ambisonic manipulation of sound and so forth, there are still a lot of questions for me that remain in terms of how we hear and understand and can comprehend spatial audio. Um, this sort of question lies at the heart of, of, of my approach to spatial uh, audio production. Uh, and a lot of the concepts that, that centered around that are very, very simple. Um, you know, for example, um, normally if you're recording a pigeon in this way with a microphone placed at that sort of distance, uh, you get a very nice and clean representation. But of course, the nature of the microphone and the capsule that's on the end of the microphone will determine the essentially a pressure representation of that um, um, of that ob of that sound and not really anything to do with its geometry or size which becomes a problem when we want to understand what its geometry or size is so effectively you know this pigeon might as well be this big as far as that recording is concerned because there is nothing apart from you know, certain aspects of, its, of, its, uh, of the, the, the pressure waves it generates that's captured with a traditional um, microphone technique. Quite a lot of, 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 of spatial sound systems will take a point source, as it's referred to in audio terms, um, of that sort and move it between loudspeakers, flying it around in abstract trajectories, I mean, um, which uh, you know, is, is an, certainly an approach one, one can take. But from my perspective, it's very hard to perceive that without understanding the context for it, you know, the relative motion against something else, the environment in which something's moving, uh, or at least some cues to how a point of sound should, should move about in space uh, in, in some way. So from my perspective, the challenge is to create something that can capture spatial information very much as part and integral to the mixes and the balances of sound and also the contents of sound uh, that we that we put into spatial ins installations and uh, performances. Um, one of the other theories that we uh, investigated was that of information-led perception, uh, uh, which again I think is a very important thing. Uh, is this is a type of perception where a sufficient degree of pertinent information can actually trigger a brain model into seeing something uh, or experiencing something um, that, we, that, that is part of our normal perception and our understanding of the world around us. I don't have a big sound system here to explain this to you, but this, this, the, the most simple explanation I return to again and again in my talk, so apologies to anybody who's seen this before, um, are a series of experiments in the visual domain done by uh, the, the late Richard Gregory. Um, these are experiments that are published on uh, and maintained still on a website that's uh, available at that, um, at that URL. So you can go and check these out for yourself. Um, Richard Gregory exper uh, experiment with visual perception, uh, and I'm trying to understand visual perception, um, f uh, it, it, by looking at visual anomalies, things that might, might not uh, be part of our normal perception. And, and this was a, uh, an experiment he did uh, with a face mask, and it's a face mask, uh, as he describes on his website, uh, something that you uh, clearly recognize. You understand that this is a vacuum-formed face, and on the other side of this, as it rotates around, um, you know that it's something that's designed to go onto your face and fit on your face. However, you probably, when you see it lit in this way and filmed in this way, recognize that um, there's a, a significant period when you're looking at the back of the mask where the face comes out of the screen, or appears to come out of the screen. The nose projects and doesn't go into the screen. So, uh, you know, hopefully if I tell you that it goes into the screen now and I tell you exactly, uh, uh, reiterate again what this material is, which you know very well, this time you'll see it going into the screen. Except you don't. <laughs> and you can't. And it's, and it's very difficult uh, for, for people to, uh, to see that in, in that way. Um, what Richard Gregory proposed was that uh, there's a point at which you see three points on the face, the relationship between the eye, the nose, and the, and the cheek, which suddenly says to you, this is a face. And because that's such a profound understanding of those, the, the, that information, you can only ever see it as a face and something that doesn't have a nose going inside it. Uh, right, it sticks out, rather. So there are many perceptual phenomena which actually, I think, impinge upon our uh, spatial audio perception as well as our visual um, spatial perception. Um, uh, things like the significance of certain sounds, objects that loom towards us are very much more significant to us than those that recede away from us. Um, proximate sounds that are very close to us also attract our attention uh, enormously. Um, and uh, many other sounding objects 
object affordances uh, and our knowledge of them contribute to how we understand things. Um, there's certainly a, a visual dominance in the perception system. We do apply our whole sense uh, mechanism to uh, anything we perceive. And I think uh, those of you who might have perceived, uh, seen the installation will uh, understand that visual dominance can lead us not to believe what we hear. And so quite, quite often closing your eyes in an installation of, that sort, uh, of the sort that we make uh, is, is a very productive thing to do. Um, so the aim of me applying all of these types of uh, consideration to the production of spatial audio uh, um, uh, material is to produce something that can really appeal to our perception in some way. A lot of the time I use ambisonic technologies still, uh, not exclusively, but, but quite often. And the idea of these is they capture a sort of surround uh, sound in three dimensions. So from an ambisonic mic, you get something which might capture effectively a bubble of sound that surrounds the mic and as it, as it arrives at the mic. And the concept is simply that that bubble of sound is reproduced with the loudspeakers that actually contribute to constructing or reconstructing that bubble. Um, most people who um, may have encountered a mic are probably familiar with um, the, the fact that different mics have different directivity. And the way that ambisonics works is to, um, rather than a, like a microphone that you might have seen uh, somebody use if they're doing a live vocal performance or something, holding a microphone in their hand, um, they have a, a directivity response where the sensitivity of the microphone is very much in front of the microphone, such as this one. So. Um, it's good to have an example here as well. Um, so if I put my face here, the microphone is very sensitive to it. If I put my face here, it's not. So the hand noise or, or, or what have you on the microphone isn't picked up by the, the microphone because of that directivity pattern. And um, there's a certain shape to that pattern. Um, ambisonic microphones actually pick, pat, uh, pick up um, sound in three dimensions. So there's a Z plane, which picks an up down sound and an X plane for side to side. Uh, and front to back, uh, a, a Y-plane. And there's also an omnidirectional uh, sensitivity all around. And these are combined all together uh, in various commercially available microphones to capture um, a three-dimensional sound. And of course, this is three-dimensional sound that has a geometry. When it, a recording in ambisonics will separate out in space because it has all of these components, the sound that emanates from my mouth or from my chest or reflects off the lectern or bounces off the walls in their relative geometric positions. And that really supports uh, an understanding of, uh, uh, of spatial sound as it's, as it's presented. For those who are technically uh, interested, um, the ambisonics actually does a spherical harmonic deconstruction of the sound field and divides it into components. The, the four components I've just spoken about are the very highest four on this, on this triangle uh, of, of uh, directivity patterns that you can see. Um, and that's what's called first order ambisonics. As you increase the number of these, and you can, you can go on infinitely, when you get to a very large number, uh, ambisonics will create very, very realistic sound that will actually travel inside the sphere. Um, but the more of these components you add, the, the, the greater the level of precision uh, that you get um, in, the, in the reproduction and, and decoding. The decoding of these um, uh, types of uh, ambisonic material Oh, actually, before I mention that, I should say that um, uh, it's possible to also uh, synthetically produce ambisonic samples if you don't have ambisonic recordings. And one of the things that, that we spend a long time doing is recreating sound fields from multiple sound sources and recordings that Yana has and um, uh, creating these artificial sound fields, which we can then manipulate and move around. Um, the idea of reproducing this sound, you can imagine in most concert halls, means that um, a floor is required for people to stand rather than have their heads floating in the middle of some imaginary sphere. And there are effectively speakers underneath the floor. So in installations like we, uh, we have here, there are certain time and loudness compensations for floor speakers. And also the speakers on all of the faces of the, of the wall that actually project them onto this sphere of, of sound. Uh, so they're not, they don't sound uh, in the same way as they would in, the, in a particular space. Um, uh, a particular geometric configuration like that, they should sound like they're all on the surface of this sphere, um, re reproducing a, a continuous and very smooth um, um, sound field. <clears throat> As I said, this sound field can have a lot of um, 
material projecting on its outside and that's not always a, uh, uh, something that, that's desirable. I had a fantastic opportunity to go and visit uh, Johannes Goebbels um, MPAC, uh, Experimental Media and um, Performing Arts Centre in Rensselaer Poly Polytechnic Troy a couple of years ago where we did a performance with a uh, a fifth order ambisonic system, which is a 64 loudspeaker dome, six loudspeaker subs. Uh, and then used a system that they've devised there called wave field synthesis um, arrays, um, which, which contains something like 496 channels of audio and are able to project sound up to nine meters away from where that array is. So with this combined system, we actually did some work where we could produce ambisonic sound fields around the outside of the concert hall and project down into the audience between them seats next to their ears from the arrays suspended above the, uh, the auditorium there. Um, <coughs> spatial audio is not without its uh, uh, difficulties. Um, if, we, um, if this chap were to record our, our famous pigeon with a sound field microphone in a location like that, it would be um, uh, maybe a very distant recording, but it would actually reproduce the, the, uh, the, the uh, bird very well. If this uh, composer decided that they wanted a much closer and detailed recording of this uh, uh, animal, they might well move the microphone to be very close like that, which in normal circumstances would provide you with a very detailed uh, close recording. But in ambisonic circles, when one expands that, what you end up with is something like this, which becomes a very hard thing to perceive because the sounds emanating from the beak or the feathers or whatever are so separated in space, it's not possible to conceive it as a whole. There's a very good example of this, which it requires my attention as a spatial uh, audio producer. Um, in Jana's piece, you'll, you'll hear um, waves recorded ambisonically that, that spread through the whole uh, of the venue. When we first auditioned this in various spaces on a large sound system, we did discover that we couldn't understand it at all. It didn't make any sense. It didn't sound correct in some way. And after a lot of discussion and thought, it sort of transpired that Yana had had quite a low microphone to capture the sound of the waves moving underneath it in, and placed in the water like that to capture that soundscape. Uh, and of course, on a direct reproduction, that's effectively like this, which is not a very common way of us hearing sound or appreciating uh, a wave scape. So, you know, one of the roles that I would have in, in, in producing this work is to modify the signals that come from the ambisonic um, uh, uh, microphone to reposition the effective listening position, which is something you can do once you've got this directivity information uh, recorded in the first place. Um, I have actually developed a, a, an ambisonic underwater microphone. This is something we tried out on the same trip that uh, Jana showed with the humpback whales. And, um, uh, and, and it doesn't really feature in this piece, but it's something we're, we're still sort of uh, working and, and uh, developing. Um, I want to move quickly on to the sort of <laughs> a few general words about uh, what I said about the installation, just by, by way of, um, of concluding these presentations. Um, the art of listening underwater has a very clear focus on, <clears throat> on, on underwater sound. Um, I think the title is also significant because it's an art that very few people are, are aware of. The oceans constitute the majority of the Earth's surface. Um, they're the most sound rich environments on the planet where visibility is often restricted. It means that communication, finding mates, food, home, social interactions uh, are, are used in the audio domain by almost every aquatic uh, animal. This is largely unknown, I think, and I think unknown to our experience and also in some ways unknowable to us because sound rarely comes out of the oceans. We don't experience it. We don't have the physiological mechanism to hear underwater well uh, and listen to the animals or their underwater environments for that matter. Uh, outside, the opportunities that are presented by works like Yarners and other people who use hydrophones to create um, uh, recordings. The impact of sand pollution in the oceans, as pointed out by Duarte and the 20 other ocean experts, including Yana, who uh, published their science paper in 2021, uh, which is called the, Sa the Soundscape of the Anthropocene Ocean, um, is one of the most significant damaging consequences of human actions. In their own words, sand 
is the sensory cue that travels farthest through the ocean and is used by marine animals ranging from invertebrates to great whales to interpret and explore the marine environment and to interact within and among species. Ocean soundscapes are rapidly changing because of massive declines in the abundance of sound producing animals, increases in anthropogenic noise and altered contributions of geological sources such as sea ice and storms owing to climate change. As a result, the soundscape of the Anthropocene Ocean is fundamentally different from that of pre-industrial times, with anthropogenic noise negatively impacting marine life. It's my hope that bringing underwater sound materials to our human experience will support a, an embodied engagement with elements of oceanic soundscapes to uh, establish an empathy with sound dependent marine life and an understanding and education about their world for all of those people who are directly or indirectly contributing to sound pollutions in the ocean. I should say that The Art of Listening Underwater is not a marine documentary, nor is it about these uh, themes. It provides an artistic aesthetic experience uh, through its encounter with marine life. But I think uh, this and similar installations do provide listeners with an opportunity for thought, reflection and contemplation uh, and an awareness. Uh, artworks of this type can engender a sense of awe, amazement, of intrigue, uh, of horror or of beauty guided by the artists. They can act as a focus of our attention on worlds and concerns which are otherwise hidden to us to perhaps encourage future sensitivities and positive actions. Thanks for listening. Getting a lot of questions, but we'll start by asking you a few questions. Um, so great we get to see each other <laughs> for a minute. Sorry, I completely <laughs> forgot about that. Um, so thank you both so much. I, I, I think that this last week, I've never thought so much about sound, and I've never thought so much about sound that is, is, is inaudible as I have, and we're so grateful. I think it's been a revelation for, for a lot of people to have this experience. And I, I, I like the title a lot. I was thinking about the title, The Art of Listening Underwater, because I think it goes two ways. In one sense, it's um, for the audience. Like what it, the, to develop the art of listening is part of the experience. But on the other hand, it's also, um, people expect, I think, there are some people who come expecting it to be a documentary, a document, like a documentary of sound. Mm. But it, it is not that. It's an art, it's an art piece. And, and that adds a dimension to it. So I thought it would be great if you just talked about that for a minute, because I've been explaining that to people too. Yeah. Um, so no, any, think, anywhere you want to go. Yeah, I think, you know, it came because it was made for Art Basel, you know, and, and it was specifically made a title for that situation where you would want to attract because it was outside of the actual uh, very very VIP areas and I wanted to be sort of open for everyone and attract people you know so the art you know at this Miami Art Basel fair art fair thing <laughs> Uh, of listening underwater was like what you know this kind of thing. So yeah. you, you would, uh, Richard, you know, basically attract people to it. And, uh, it got us. We yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Gavin and I were there. We loved it. But it is also the art of listening underwater. Yeah, yeah. So you know that result. The art that results from listening yeah. underwater. So we have kept the title, of course. I mean, it's, it can work. Uh, but I, but I really so, yeah. think that. One of the great joys of it, and I just feel so lucky that I've gotten to have the experience a few times in the last few days, is you get better at it. There is an art to listening underwater, which you've been developing for a very long time, both of you. But for someone who has not done that, you give yourself to it more and more each time. 
-hmm. and you hear more and more each time. So I only can imagine that you've had this experience for such a long time now that you must have a much deeper listening capacity. Yeah. No, I think, you know, you become to be, by practicing listening and you, you, you know, always listen very carefully out there. Uh, always with headphones is how I work, but it's other ways to work, not having monitoring all the time, of course, but uh, you, you know, close your eyes out there also and, uh, you know, holding the hydrophone cables and, uh, you know, sometimes I have four and then having them not toes as well and, you, and just listen very carefully and you start to kind of move into that sound environment um, you know, as you are out there and then you can hear if there is this is something that is alive you know I, I don't use camera on purpose because I like to just listen for what is the uh, life there and um, you know, or what is also the distant kind of roar of the big ocean if I'm in the fjord or if the depth of the fjord, you might hear like there's a sol um, solitary pilot whale in the, in the composition there. And um, he, is, uh, he, he was singing to a boy, you know, he came first <laughs> to, this, uh, to the boat and he met us with like a lot of sort of echolocating uh, sound and uh, almost sounding like a, like an engine, you know. Almost it communicated with us in the boat, we had stopped the engine. But, and, but then he just swam away uh, from us and there was uh, this boy and he started to have this song. And it's, it's so moving, you know, because there's also an echo on it. Uh, that uh, is comfortable because it's a very deep fjord. So it's using the natural echo uh, that was uh, there, I think. Mm -hmm. You know, but this is again, you know, my kind of thinking what he would think is I don't know. But he seemed to enjoy his own voice there, maybe. But he's, uh, yeah, it's not unusual because he's on his own. They're normally in pods of many, but he's decided to hang there in that field. There is a, a story, you might not know, a Ray Bradbury science story, science fiction writer, about um, a, um, a sea creature that falls in love with a lighthouse. And, mm -hmm. and sings to it and comes to visit it. And yeah. Yeah, that's kind of a, what you just said is so wonderful. Not so far from the truth, eh? Sort of yeah. singing to a buoy, buoy you know. Yeah. Um, I, th I mean, I think this, uh, this idea of getting better at listening is something that, that is, is well known. That, you know, we do quite often, as Murray Schaefer said originally, we tune out of sounds because of, we're disturbed by them a lot of the time. A lot of, the sound, a lot of the sounds we don't want to hear. And therefore, we train ourselves not to hear things and not to be disturbed by things. And it is really a matter of going back the other way and training yourself mm. really to listen to things and listen to the things that are very distant from you and, and, and understand what you're hearing in some way. Mm. So I think it is a little bit of a lost art, I think. It's something you can regain and develop and, and, uh, and get better at. I think I'm better at listening to the birds here in New York. I hear them more clearly now than last time I was here. Because it is... You know, through this time I'm listening a lot to bird song in the, around the studio and the first thing I heard you know outside of the hotel there in, in Broadway it was these massively loud uh, sparrows I mean if you check you might you know knowing living here that they are very loud you know because they're also trying to find their kind of place in the whole spectrum of being masked by all the noise that uh, we make you know so they they increase volume and change frequencies uh, accordingly. So uh, I'll show you, you know, do notice. You know, and then you start to see how they behave and you know, start to notice them again. And they're not again, I mean, better every day. You know? <laughs> it's great. You know, New York falls in love with birds. Mm. It's, it's completely in love with the hawks in Central Park, mm. the pale male and pale male mate. Mm. <laughs> and last year there was this beautiful white owl and people would just, mm. just people get crazy. Like, um, and the other day, there was a bald eagle at the reservoir hunting all the ducks that are out in the reservoir. And there were just, mm. everyone was out to see. It's a sort of this, maybe because we live in such an extreme urban environment that, I um, mean, as London, and, yeah. uh, that there is such a need to connect, you know. But the concept of listening is also very important for psychoanalysts. It's very important for uh, it's a part of Buddhist thinking that how much do we give ourselves over to actually listening to the people who are close to us, but also to everything around us. Mm. This is a very important point of orientation, you know, 
So I think it's a, it's, um, a pedagogical piece, too, without trying to be. And it's an art piece that serves so many functions. But one of them really is to just slow us down and make us to sit and lay. People were, a, a lot of people were on the double ottomans. I noticed <laughs> laying on both ottomans and just gone, you know, completely zoned out into this imaginary situation of feeling as if you really are underwater. I mean, some of the people who will be listening to us won't have ever get to have this experience, but maybe they will in some other part of the world when you, when you do it somewhere else. Um, but, but, I want, but I want to ask you one more thing before I move on to another question. Um, has there ever been, when you've been listening, you said something about the pilot well, where you were just shocked? Like you almost fell off the boat because you like heard something that, like, what is this? You know, so mysterious. Yeah. No, I think the, the first time I heard a really large school of fish there in China, in Thailand, uh, the first slide was uh, from. It was so, it was dark. It was like uh, around full moon where the fish is particularly um, active. You know, there's a lot of nutrients. The pull of the, from the moon is uh, larger, the tide get larger. And there's lots of food around and they are, uh, you know, active. And it was insane. It sounds like I've been layering lots of little sounds on top of each other, but it's not. It's just like all these fish in the middle of the school. It's, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. But they keep coming, though, the moments. And that's why it's so endlessly exciting. I think that exactly mm. what I was going to say. I think this is endlessly mm. exciting. Mm. From this very minuscule insects underwater to these enormous creatures underwater to what you said about whales to uh, learning a new song mm. each year. Like that happens here. That I mean, that that, that was the moment when when my jaw fell when we we were, went to the Silverbanks Marine Reserve, which is north of the Dominican Republic. It's not a very easy place to get to. It's sort of ten hours sailing north of the Dominican Republic, and it's a, a sheltered coral peak, which forms a, a sort of very shallow inland sea, which is very safe for mating, finding mates, having birth, looking after infants. And as we understood it, something like 80% of the world's humpback whales travel to that place uh, for that purpose and then go away again. And they sing a lot when they're there because the males are trying to attract females and they hang in the water. When we arrived there after, you know, quite a lot of palaver, as you might imagine, uh, with an experienced boat crew who knew about the sort of things we were doing, we were sort of expecting a normal field recording trip where we, uh, you know, we spend three weeks getting wet, uh, salty and, and, and cold, and record five seconds of sound. Um, but we arrived and we thought, well, throw some hydrophones in just to see if there are any animals around here to work out what our work is going to be like this week. And it was the most extraordinary cacophony of maybe 200 whales, all singing simultaneously. And we just passed these headphones around to all members of the crew who everybody's jaw dropped. It was just an extraordinary moment because you're completely unaware that these animals were anywhere in the vicinity. But as soon as the hydrophones goes in the water, it was like the biggest choir you could ever imagine. But you know, you see it with people, or you experience it with people when they're upstairs. I'm pointing upstairs because that's where the installation is. When they hear a whale or a seal, maybe not even know exactly what that creature is, it's like, it's so thrilling to mm. people. So we, I think there's such a hunger among humans to uh, connect to other species that we really want this. And um, COVID was a very interesting time because many people did slow down and had to stay put, as I said, and things got quieter, but they also got quieter inside people. Mm. And this need or desire to connect with other species, I think, became even stronger. Mm. I want to ask you something that I think a lot of people don't understand, and um, I didn't understand. <laughs> And I said to Tony and to Yana, like, okay, so I saw it in, I saw it in Miami. I, I mean, I experienced the piece in Miami. And it was very womb-like and it was dark and it was round and it was just fabulous, but it was completely different. Mm -hmm. And now um, with new recordings added, of course, but experiencing it up in a very different kind of space. But how do you do that? Like what happens? Like you come, I think people would like to understand that. You come to that room and mm -hmm. then what? Like, yeah, no, I think you know, you, yeah, you, you know, I will also, you know, you come to the room and you're testing out. I mean, the, the, any room, you know, any new place, uh, because you need to kind of hang there a bit, and then you start testing sounds in there, 
and, and calibrate the setup uh, properly uh, of speakers. And then you can start to place uh, the sounds. You're going to have that skeleton for this piece. There was a skeleton from uh, uh, Miami, but I, you know, I've been working uh, knowing that it would be so different, you know, because of we, we have talked about this space before. And then you really just have to listen, walk around, and then start to place things, move things around, you know, in that space. Mm. You know, it's, it's like, you know, I, 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 I'm not sure we emphasized it enough in our presentations, but mm. a large part of the creation of these works happens in the space. Yeah. So we are in touch, of course, and when I'm looking at architectural drawings of the space a long time in advance to work out what was possible yeah. to do there. But nothing uh, really can prepare you for some, sometimes for the acoustic experience. Uh, and, and it's always been Yana's practice to be in the space for a few days prior to a piece being exhibited to actually make sure that it fits and it's site specific and it works yeah. in the space. It, was a very, it seemed to be a very simple difficulty moving it from Miami to here. Miami was a relatively small space, you know, probably the size of the stage area. And we took a sound field that had been made for that small space and did this to it. Yeah. <laughs> and suddenly it was very sparse. It was not really connected with the space. It wasn't articulating the space. It sounded empty not really present, not very much of a thing. You know? And then what happened? And then what do you do? And I was thinking, well, there were some, yeah. some words were used uh, <laughs> about how much work we might have to do. <laughs> and then Jana starts working. <laughs> oh, well, we worked yeah. together on... on, on, on but, yeah. but, but for those of us who are not sound specialists and spatial acoustic specialists, what is that work? Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, I place, you know, sitting in the middle there, and uh, you know, having now also experience of different types of size of spaces. And uh, like I said to you also earlier, that you know, approaching it also quite sculpturally, you know, I would say, you know, yeah. I actually like making things. I used to do sculpture <laughs> and then, you know, I like drawing a lot. Um, and it's like you use, it's like you have the overall thing, you have the whole big thing. And then you start to place things, you know, as you compose inside of this space and you make things round and shapes and put things mm -hmm. so it becomes uh, the whole, a whole kind of thing, and a development, a movement. Mm. Uh, but I'm not so interested in sort of flying things around. You know, it's, it doesn't really make sense unless there is something that, like the boat, you might experience the boat is coming from the Hudson and it goes out of the door in the back. You know, so it, at first I had the coming from inside going out of the window, but uh, that didn't work. So I moved the boat around so I can do these kind of things, you know, because it felt and then that uh, the pilot well sits up here and then you know, it be answered by some humpbacks and then the humpback choir over there and you start to have this kind of communications in the space and then this school of fish comes in you know, uh, and right after the boat uh, you have this very quiet Sets these small sounds because you've just been so overwhelmed with this boat, you know, this human presence. So uh, yeah. you have a narrative. Yeah, I, I have. To, uh, for, You're creating a you narrative. Know, I'm telling you the narrative, but I want you to have your I own know. narrative. <laughs> you know, <laughs> but, I understand. Yeah. I just, I think, but we have a lot of artists who are listening. Yeah. So I think that the art part is, is all this, mm. and you as artist, as creator, um, both of you, how, how you how you think about that. You don't have to tell us the story, but the fact that you have one is really interesting. That the boat couldn't be coming from the building to the water, had to be yeah. coming from the water to the building, is, is fabulous, yeah. just even to imagine. And, and, and the way you talk about it in this sculptural way, and the way you move your body, yeah. <laughs> you're, you're acting out the, yeah. the creation of the sculpture, this, this notion of sound as sculpture, I think is so, I think there's something I want to mention now because I think it's very important is that the visual elements of these kind of installations are also very uh, important, you know, because uh, like we were talked about a lot, you know, where will people come in? And then they, you know, do they have like somewhere instead of putting people straight into the space like it is if there is nothing, you know, we have 
people we want people to go for a while so they can fade out the outside and fade in the new experience so you have a little walk there there is just uh, you know and then where do you enter from determines also where the cables are on the floor where we put there to sit you know where and then you in this situation you go out on the other side so you just you work with this and the decisions that I really like uh, this is a wonderful you know view out there on the window and then keeping that but not keeping it totally open where it's so visually overpowering because then it becomes too destructive you know um, so then you just have this mesh that flattens it, it becomes an image, but it's slightly moving there with the smoke and the changing of the light and this natural light on purpose, you know, so that you can experience it at different lights at different time of day. So you can come back later in the day and it will be a different experience, you know, because it... You know, I think my favorite time is between five and six, you know, mm -hmm. uh, when you have like the, the uh, light is uh, the city slowing starts down and the animating. city starts to go, yeah. you know, and mm, but favorites is different. I don't like to have favorites, but it's just still a different. Um, so, there are yeah. so many, um, there's so much I want to ask and there's so many questions, there's so many questions. Yeah. So um, I'm just going to start with a few questions and then I'm going to keep my eye on the time. And then I have just a few things I want to ask too. So, okay. Uh, so we have obviously some sound people out there asking very specific. So I'll, let's do a few of those. Um, I'd love to hear, this is from Allison. I'd love to hear more about the microphone Yana uses. Is it capturing sound from multiple angles at once? When Yana records fish, how does she know which species she is capturing? Uh, is there a diver with a camera identifying them underwater when she's above on the boat? I don't think so. When she says she has recordings of crustaceans, is the sound of the shellfish rubbing against things underwater, or is it a sound they emit? Yeah. So pick any of that. <laughs> Gosh, wet. Yeah, wet the first spell. one. Yeah, a lot of yeah. stuff. Okay, I've been start with the hydrophones. And there, the hydrophones. Well, there aren't, there aren't directional hydrophones, apart from, I mean, there none exist, really, apart from that one that I showed an image of. Uh, that we have used in some in some cases, but it's not featured in this piece. So uh, the spatialness of these environments are composed artificially by working within that sort of sound sphere that I showed in the diagrams, but carefully placing the hydrophones. And Yana always uses multiple hydrophones. It's not just one hydrophone. Um, so there's always some spatial information which I can extract or we can spread out or we can put into certain locations that give you a, give it a sense of space. But, but part of the work in in the gallery is building up this space the dimensions of it the what sounds are distant what sounds approximate how they change and how they move around and so forth um, and that's part of what we do in the space with these particular sounds but essentially yours are either mono stereo or quad yeah uh, four channel recordings yeah. on hydrophones a different depth because sounds yeah. is very different at different depths um you know and um in terms of which fish, uh, this is a communication with local people. There, where I am, it's like you know, I'm talk to uh, you know, for example, Ludwig Gamanyai in China, uh, where I was with Paulin on Susina. We were out with him, and uh, afterwards we were actually putting. Um, you know, big sheets of paper and we were drawing and he was talking about which um, species were where and, you know, and then you talk to, you know, every, everywhere is sort of local fisherman that knows where the different species are likely to be and then you hear them again and again, uh, you get to know who they are, where, uh, which they are, you know, and this popping sound of crustaceans can be snapping shrimp, but it's not always snapping shrimp. It can be barnacles, it can be fish uh, that also emits these uh, crackling sounds. So there, the, but I think that's some of the really uh, interesting stuff is uh, these questions and not necessarily having a camera. Uh, I, mm. you know. No, there are, I mean, the, the, that, that crackling sound that you hear in the background of a lot of recordings is present in every ocean everywhere in the world. Everywhere we've put a hydrophone, you hear that. And a little way up rivers until the salinity changes and then, then you don't hear it anymore. Mm. It's everywhere. But nobody really knows what it is. Yeah. Oh, it's a great question. Everybody says, oh, it's popping shrimp. Oh, it's uh, not it, always it, popping it's shrimp. Everywhere, <laughs> thousands and thousands and thousands yeah. of them. 
Um, some people say it's cavitation in the water. Some people say it's the joints of animals moving. I've heard all sorts of stories about yeah. it. Nobody actually knows, yeah. for sure, because you can't see anything. You don't understand what it is. Well, then I guess you can't answer this question very well. Um, there's a section. <laughs> um, this one is about someone who says, I'd love to be able to identify. This is um, uh, Sinan. I'd love to be able to identify the sounds as I am hearing them next time I attend the exhibit. Is there any way I can do it? That you Sounds can, like you yeah. can't even do it because, it because no one can do all well, of it. Nobody can, nobody can do it, no. And I'm not sure it's productive yeah. to but do it because no. it isn't a documentary about, no. about uh, animals or whatever. And, and one becomes more familiar with them. I mean, I think you can recognize that sea mammals have a certain way of making a sound and fish have a certain way of making a sound. Um, but beyond that, it's quite, it's quite difficult unless you're actually there with the animals. Yeah, but I think, you know, it is definitely possible, you know, you can, mm. you can use a camera and uh, researchers are, you know, doing mm. that. And I, I couldn't do it. I can do it. I can also tell you, uh, I mean, there is this um, uh, piece on YouTube where, uh, <laughs> I mean, I put, uh, made a, a little composition, composition for the when this paper were published, uh, just as a kind of in addition to it, not as part of the paper, but uh, and and somebody was asking, and I did actually list all the um, species. But problem in an installation like this, if you have a list, is that you start listening for that mm -hmm. fish, you know, and then you forget to listen to the whole of it, you know, because you say, oh, where's that fish? You know, well, there must be this fish, or oh, no, it must okay. be that sound or that sound, mm -hmm. and then you lose. Uh, the ability to lose yourself in the in the piece and fall asleep or just like relax into it and not actually just uh, you know it's not there to be listened to as that and that and that but I can do that in a talk so invite me for a talk I can talk about it then I, I admitted to <laughs> Jana that in, I fell asleep in Miami yeah I just went that's so great yeah I know it was great I thought <laughs> um, we're gonna run out of time okay yeah um, there's, now, I, I talked to you about this, too, about this feeling like I was listening to a symphony. Um, I, 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 and it had to do with, it felt like themes were repeat, repeating or were coming back the way they do in a symphony, and um, that things would ebb and flow in this way. So here, someone asking, Joanne is asking something similar. There's a section in the installation where elongated tones emanated from three or four voices in ensemble that creates symphonic sonority. What a nice word. A beauty I had to sing along with quietly, in parentheses, what was that? Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm not sure about question. the exact section. It's that, probably that uh, material from the Hudson River, you know, the, you know those yeah, tones. Maybe. Yeah, I don't know which exactly section she means, though, but um, I, I think, yeah. But well, she wants to know what it was exactly, what the recordings are. Yeah, I think, yeah, yeah, I, but think I, I had that to feeling, too, that I yeah. was listening to Mahler at some times. Mm -hmm. Just the way things came up and came down, yeah. And then all of a sudden there'd be this crescendo, and it just really, there was a composition to it that uh, yeah. I became more and more aware of, uh, like the third time. Mm. Yeah, you know. Yeah, because there is sort of yeah a lot of gut feeling decisions too. You know, something that sounds that it sounds good. I hope want to go to sound good as a listening experience. So summer, yeah, but I think I mean I think that, that, that symphonic is is a good adjective mm -hmm. to use, but I, I don't think it's it's quite accurate in the in the way that you know symphonies are conceived and constructed. I mean, the honor is following the sort of density of the sound, and of course, if there's a very big sound, which and the loudest sound in the in the piece is this research vessel, that boat sound that intrudes uh, on the soundscapes, is a very powerful and overwhelming experience. Right. It's bass heavy. It's full. It's big. Um, and one can only stand that sort of sound for, for a certain period of time. Unfortunately, the trajectory of that within the piece makes sense for it to go away and to diminish. But following it with this very, very quiet material, of course, is a choice, as Iana described earlier, that, that allows people to reflect and, and gather themselves again after that intensity. Well, also that which, is, of course, the same thing happens in symphonies too. Yeah. yeah. Which they are in the environment, you know, those big Yeah, shows. that you feel that intrusion. Yeah. I want to ask one more question for him, then I have one more question for you, and then we have to end. Um, so here's from Summer J. After working so many years with recording sound, how much more sensitive have you become 
to the sounds that you hear in your daily life, in your home space especially, are you striving, striving towards silence or the minimization of sound no. in your own living space? Yeah, no, but uh, for me, of course, now, I mean... You listen to heavy metal, right? Yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I do enjoy it. There's like massive amount of, uh, of sound. It's not, I'm not striving for silence, you know, that, or in any way it doesn't exist. Silence would be, you know, when I'm dead. It's uh, because I hear my, myself, you know, even if I'm in a relatively quiet place, I would hear myself. There would never be silence. Uh, as long as I'm alive, you know, and uh, it's scary to me if you go to the beach and there is uh, silence. I mean, if there's not birds there, there is not, you know, it's um, it's not good if it's uh, too silent. But uh, of course, around in the city, it can be overwhelmingly overpowering. Uh, so you can't, we can't hear each other even, you know, as, as humans and have to shout at each other, you know, which is can be a bit overwhelming. So, uh, yeah. Tony, anything on that? Well, I think it is about the sensitivity to sound. I think what we're, mm. having just nipped around the corner for something to eat before this, <laughs> uh, before this presentation, we found ourselves in a place that was blaring out just with Japanese TV, so loud to an empty room uh, that we could hardly speak to each other. Um, and it was so uh, aggressive and so imposing on the environment. I think that's where the challenge is arise is if, when sound is not really considered it's and it's and it, uh, its reception is not really considered and what it does to the to the environment so yeah a quiet, I, I agree a quiet environment is not what we want but something that is uh, uh, or we aspire to but something that is sensitive um, uh, is probably better I just thought that the share something that was meant about was in the forest where the fa factory yeah. of Audemars Piguet and there's some very old trees there. And I went out in the um, uh, early, early in the morning to do recordings at the dawn chorus. And I was sitting uh, in the base of one of these uh, on the ground. And the soundscape was so tall. You know, I was closing mm -hmm. my eyes. And, it, and the birds were really high up, you know, <laughs> in these really tall trees. And it's only there because we've let these trees, uh, the trees had been able to stand there for that long and mm. be, grow that tall that the birds are so high up. So I could close my eyes, it's a massive space. If the trees were cut down, you know, suddenly this, the, it, the soundscape are completely, completely different. And then also when now in, with COVID outside of my studio, there was like every day at nine o'clock, there were some swans flying over. Swans. Swans, yeah, they, they came every day at night, three of them. And they were flying over. I could hear them from really far away. They flew over and over and over and long, and never heard such long space mm. around there. And, and then the um, cars started to come back. And there's a road there, there's a road there, totally masked on both sides. I didn't hear that anymore. And I missed that long space and, and that tall space, mm. which was really, really beautiful. I'll never forget it. Mm -hmm. So we must preserve, we must, you know, remember these things. We're making the, our space like really small. But those, those are exactly small things small. That, we, that, you know, that we would be denied yeah. by the intrusion of other, uh, other sounds. Yeah. Can, I, can I ask one last thing because we're going to have to stop. But, so we're living in a very complex moment. Um, we, know the, we know because of climate change, we, radical shifts are happening in our... Um, physical environment and therefore in our psychic environment as well and since we have a lot of artists here and we're talking to a lot of artists out there and people who are creative thinkers in, ma in many ways um, what do you think now is the the place that artists can take in the world what is what is the what is the role or a part of how does one think about oneself now or how do you think about yourselves now or has that changed in any way for you? Um, I've been thinking about these things like most of my life. You know? I had a book that was from 1972 called SOS for the Planet. It was a message for all children of the world. It was a UNESCO book. It was talking about the same things we're talking about now. You know, yeah. And this is like 40... Um, five years ago, 
Yeah. So, no, it was 15 years ago, actually. Uh, what we, uh, what an artist's goal. Well, I think we all, from all different uh, subjects and all different people, I mean, we, we just need to speak together and listen, you know, and, you know, and, and yeah. Listen is yeah, a good operative a, word for this conversation. Yeah, it, yeah I think it's a... a um, it's the incarnation of humanity. It's the expression of being human uh, in, in some way. has a, has a very powerful thing to say. And obviously, the work that we do has some potency in, in revealing issues that, that are otherwise people might not engage with. And so, you know, for us, that's a very important part of, uh, of what we do. But I think that there's an increasing role for artists to try and move a little bit beyond what are overwhelming cultures of... of of you know, very large international corporations and and in the domain that we've been talking about today, you know, shipping lanes that are dividing humpback whale populations but are supplying our supermarkets. Um, there are great conflicts which somehow we need to we need to address and answer and understand. I think art has a very vital role to play in that. I'll just end with the thought that um, one of the things that's really interesting to me right now, and you both embody it very much, is the way in which art and science are coming together uh, and working together and imagining a future together. So thank you both so much and thank you so much for the installation and I hope people who are listening who can will come and it has, we're up for another week uh, at the Lenfest Center. Thank you both. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>